He was one of the pioneers of the Royal Australian Naval College, serving in both world wars, from the North Sea to the Scrap Iron Flotilla to the tropical waters around Java. He served with distinction before going down with his ship during the darkest time in Australia's naval history. Welcome to I Was Only Doing My Job, an Australian military history podcast. This is the life, service and legacy of Captain Hector MacDonald Laws Waller, who served in the Royal Navy in the First World War and the Royal Australian Navy in the Second World War, most notably in command of HMAS Stewart and HMAS Perth. Hector MacDonald Laws Waller was born on the 4th of April 1900 in Benalla, Victoria, the youngest of ten children to William Frederick Waller, a storekeeper, and his wife Helen Duncan. Known as Heck, he was educated at the Benalla Higher Elementary School. Despite growing up in the landlocked town, Waller dreamed of the sea, and he entered the Royal Australian Naval College Osborne House in Geelong as a cadet midshipman on the 31st of December 1913 within its first intake at the age of 13 and graduated in 1917 as Chief Cadet Captain, having won the King's Medal for his gentlemanly bearing, character, good influence among his fellows and officer-like qualities. Now, a hundred years later, the thought of sending a boy of 13 to serve in the Navy may seem barbaric, but there was method to the madness. Firstly, the newly established Royal Australian Naval College modelled its education and training program on the Royal Navy in that it allowed for four years of training and education during which they would progress from being a steward or clerk upon entry to finally being allowed to go to sea aboard a training vessel before being able to join the Royal Australian Navy proper as a midshipman. The other reason why was because of how comparatively low the pay for officers was at the time. The younger the recruit was meant the greater the chances the officer had in later life and the higher chance of the Navy being able to recruit cadets without having to compete with substantially better wages within the civilian sector. In 1915, the Academy relocated to Jervis Bay within the Federal Capital Territory. On the 1st of January 1918, Waller was promoted to midshipman before he and the other graduates were sent to Britain to serve as part of the Royal Navy. Waller was appointed to the battleship HMS Agincourt within the Grand Fleet in April. The Agincourt had the distinction of having mounted the most guns on the most turrets than any other dreadnought of the war. Despite this, during Waller's time aboard, the ship was primarily conducting convoy escort duties within the North Sea and didn't see any combat, though it was present for the surrender of the German High Seas Fleet on the 21st of November 1918. Waller, after the war, was assigned to the cruiser HMAS Melbourne in February 1919 for the return trip to Australia in April. He made acting sub-lieutenant in September while aboard HMAS Sydney that year and lieutenant in March 1921, coming top of his class during the examination. He went to sea as a watchkeeper and undertook professional courses in Britain before joining the staff of the Royal Australian Naval College in March 1923. The following month, Waller married Nancy Bowers at the Boulevard Methodist Church in the Sydney suburb of Lewisham on the 7th of April. Nancy's father officiated the ceremony. In April 1924, he was posted to the light cruiser HMS Adelaide, and from October that year, he was posted to HMS Victory as part of the signal school in Britain, where his classmates included Prince Louis of Battenberg, better known as the future Lord Louis Mountbatten. He topped the advanced course in May 1926, took charge of the signals and wireless telegraphy school at Flinders Naval Depot, Western Port Victoria. In 1927, the Wallers welcomed their first son Michael on the 10th of November, and the following year, in 1928, Waller was posted to Britain aboard the destroyer leader HMS Broke as a signals officer, though it is unclear if his family joined him or stayed in Australia. When the Royal Australian Navy was raised in 1911, Australia was the only dominion of the British Empire at the 1909 Defence Conference to agree to privately fund the formation of a naval fleet unit, what we now would call a battle group. While in peacetime, these ships would operate as an independent naval force in its own right, controlled by the Australian government, it was understood that in times of war, operational control would be reverted to the British Admiralty. Because of this and the fact that Australia required all of its warships from British dockyards, it looked to the Royal Navy for mentorship, support and senior leadership. Due to this, it was fairly common to have promising young officers and sailors posted to Royal Naval vessels to gain experience in larger fleet movements and training in the handling of larger and more sophisticated vessels, especially during the interwar period as the Great Depression severely affected the operational capacity of the young Australian Navy. Waller's posting aboard the Broke was the longest of his career to this point, and in 1929 resulted his promotion to Lieutenant Commander. 
In July 1930, Waller would return to Australia to serve as Squadron Signals Officer aboard the flagship of the Australian Squadron, the heavy cruiser HMAS Australia. By this stage, he had earned a strong reputation for his work with communications, and over the next two and a half years, Waller spent time in both seagoing and shore postings. The Wallers welcomed their second child, John, on the 5th of February 1934, and in June that year, Waller would be promoted to commander and appointed the executive officer of the Royal Australian Naval College, which had been moved temporarily to the Flinders Naval Depot due to the effects of the Great Depression on the defence budget and rising operational costs on the original Jervis Bay facility, which lacked land access and required supply by sea. In the latter half of 1936, Wallace spent six months attached to the British Admiralty's Naval Intelligence Division before taking up an exchange posting as Executive Officer of the repair ship HMS Resource in March 1937. From the 23rd of November 1937, an important event in his military career took place and he received his first sea command when he was appointed Commanding Officer of the destroyer HMS Brazen. Like most specialty officers in their first commands, he had initial difficulties in his ship handling capabilities, Though fortunately for him, the following 14 months included brazen monitoring the Spanish Civil War from the Mediterranean Sea, which allowed him to hone his craft as brazen protected British shipping and rescued crews of sinking ships. By June 1939, Waller returned to Australia to take up the post of Director of Signals and Communications in the Navy office in Melbourne, and this was his position at the onset of the Second World War. Afterwards, he was posted to HMAS Stewart, an obsolete destroyer leader, as its commanding officer. In this post, he was also in command of four other destroyers, the HMA ships Vampire, Vendetta, Voyager, and Waterhen. A destroyer leader was a naval designation of the late 19th and early 20th centuries for a larger destroyer with sufficient capabilities, equipment, and staff capable of coordinating the actions of groups of similarly armed vessels. The ships were en route to the Royal Navy Fleet Base of Singapore when it was decided that Waller and his ships would become the 19th Destroyer Division and be sent to the Mediterranean. When they arrived in Malta in late December, they made an immediate positive impression on the senior Royal Navy commanders in particular. Waller gained the respect of both Commander-in-Chief Admiral Viscount Sir Andrew Cunningham and Vice Admiral of Destroyers Baron John Tovey. As soon as the 19th Destroyer Division entered the Mediterranean, German Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels ridiculed the Australian ships, labelling them a consignment of scrap iron and mocked them for their lack of size, speed and armament. While he was intending to mock the 19th Destroyer Division, he wasn't wrong. These ships were entering a theater of war where the most advanced aircraft and warships were at play, and while they were struggling to keep intact, having been built by the end of this last world war. The one thing that Goebbels failed to take into account, just as he did when Lord Hor Hor labeled the Australian defenders of Tobruk the following year as rats, was the Australian penchant for reclaiming the denigrating remarks from others and wearing them as badges of pride. Admiral Cunningham, in a message read to Australia's House of Representatives, reiterated the Australian sentiment in his comments, Nobody will appreciate the scrap better than the officers and men of the Australian destroyers. However, the other thing that Goebbels neglected was the mindset of these men, who took the taunt and happily christened their ships the Scrap Iron Flotilla. They took the insult of Hitler's most zealous follower and made it their own, uniting the ships against the odds. The Scrap Iron Flotilla's primary role was to escort ships throughout the Mediterranean to ensure that the sea lines of communication remained open for the various Allied forces. And it was here that Waller's initial issues with seamanship aboard Brazen seemed to have been resolved as it was his command of Stuart that gained him praise from his superiors when the vessel assisted in the salvage of the disabled tanker Trocas. He was recommended for accelerated promotion in March and would be appointed to command the 10th Destroyer Flotilla in May which included the Australian vessels along with four additional modern Royal Navy destroyers. On the 10th of June 1940, Italy entered the war alongside the Axis countries, which at the time consisted of Germany, Japan and other smaller nations. This shifted the Scrap Island Flotilla's primary role to a searching for minefields along the North African coast. Two days later, Stuart inadvertently found one of these off the port of Alexandria by steaming straight into it. Stewart then led various ships through the minefield while awaiting the arrival of minesweepers to remove the obstacle. With many narrow escapes, it was a slow and nerve-wracking work, and when the minesweepers were sighted, the tension was relieved. Apparently, it was common at the time to have Waller dispose of mines himself by personally blowing them up by using a rifle and armor-piercing bullets, though I suspect this might be more concerning than anything else. On the 23rd of June, Stewart bombarded the Italian fortress of Bardia, and by the end of the month, Waller had been finally promoted to captain. 
One of his first actions as a newly minted captain was the participation in the indecisive Battle of Calabria, which while both Italian and British forces declared victory, was effectively a draw, though it does go down in history as the first pitched battle between naval forces of the Second World War. On the 17th of August, the Scrap Island Flotilla bombarded Fort Capuzzo, Italian seaplane base in the Gulf of Bomba, the following week. In September, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Order, or DSO, for a variety of actions, including his attacks on U-boats off Alexandria on the 14th of June and 1st of July, which in most cases resulted in damage to the submarines. The citation also noted his performance of the extremely valuable and hazardous work in locating and marking minefields, particularly those off the coast of Alexandria, by submarines. By skillful handling and with enormous courage, Waller had not only extricated his ship from the dangers, but also plotted the positions of the mines. Waller's citation continued, in addition to his gallantry and exemplary conduct on these occasions, the success achieved by the destroyers of the 10th Division, which had been under his command since commissioning earlier in the war, is a measure of its inspiring leadership. The same month, Waller transferred command to HMAS Vampire, while Stuart underwent refit. In September, Stuart attacked the Italian submarine Gonda, forcing it to surrender. In recognition for his achievements in the war to that point, in December of 1940, Admiral Cunningham gave Waller command of the newly raised inshore squadron, which comprised of destroyers, minesweepers and auxiliaries, including one of the two remaining British monitors in service. At the same time, the Allied armies, including the second raising of the Australian Imperial Force, had started to arrive in mass in Egypt and were starting limited operations in the North African campaign. Serving as Cunningham's senior officer afloat, Waller took charge of naval support for the attack on Bardia, which coincided with Australia's first involvement in the land war in the Second World War. Not long after Bardia fell to the Allies on the 5th of January 1941, Waller handed over command of the inshore squadron and returned to command Stuart. Apparently he gained quite a reputation by the men under his command, where the cooks and stewards nicknamed him Waller Hard Over Heck, as most of his will orders in action were harder starboard or harder port. Waller would lay back in his chair, pipe in mouth on the bridge, and actually wait for the dive bombers to release their bombs for ordering the wheel hard over one way or the other. Stewart and the other ships of Waller's 10th destroyer flotilla supported the assaults on Tobruk in January 1941 and Benghazi the following month. In March, Stewart escorted Allied troop transports to Greece as part of Operation Luster and narrowly avoided falling victim of Axis dive bomber attacks. Following the Battle of Cape Matapan at the end of the month, Waller's ships were credited with sinking two Italian destroyers and damaging the Italian cruiser Zara. Waller continued to earn the personal admiration of Admiral Cunningham, who described him as one of the finest types of Australian naval officers, greatly loved and admired by everyone. On the occasion of the visit to Alexandria by Australian Prime Minister Sir Robert Menzies, Cunningham escorted him to Stuart and declared, And now you are going to meet one of the greatest captains to ever sail the seas. His name is Waller. According to author Ray Parkin, who began writing while as a prisoner of war, Andrew Cunningham and Hector Waller were cast from the same mould. Men would follow them, suffer and be glad about it. From May to July, the 10th destroyer flotilla made 139 ferry runs during the siege of Tobruk, carrying supplies to the town's garrison and evacuating the wounded, gaining the additional nickname, the Tobruk Ferry. Stuart alone completed 24 supply runs before engine trouble forced the ship to return to Australia. Waller was mentioned twice in dispatches during 1941, in July for his Army Corporation role in the inshore squadron off the Libyan coast, and in November for his service during the Greek campaign. In January 1942, he was awarded a bar to his DSO for bravery and enterprise in the Battle of Cape Matapan. When Waller returned Stuart to Australia in August 1941, he visited Manila one final time, and was the guest of honour at a dinner hosted by a number of his friends from his childhood. On the 21st of October 1941, Waller was appointed to commanding officer of the modified Leander-class light cruiser HMAS Perth, itself a veteran of the Mediterranean campaign and assigned to serve in the southwest and Pacific, and was undergoing refit and repairs from her service against the Italians. It was noted at this time that Waller was tired and quite a sick man after his return, but nonetheless oversaw the rapid return of Perth to service. After completion of her refit on the 22nd of November, Perth was engaged in exercises from the 24th to 30th of November and then sat for Auckland. She carried out patrols, escort duties, exercises and manoeuvres during December of 1941 and January 1942, visiting New Caledonia and New Guinea as Japan entered the war on the side of the Axis powers. At this time, Perth was assigned to the American-British-Dutch-Australian Command, or ABDA, 
to defend the Dutch East Indies and set sail for Batavia on February 15, the same day Singapore fell to the Japanese. Perth arrived on station on the 24th of February and was attacked by Japanese aircraft over the next two days, without sustaining any damage. Perth sailed on the 25th of February to Fort Surabaya in the company of four Royal Navy ships. On the 26th of February, the ship departed Surabaya in the company of the Dutch cruisers De Ruta and Java, the American cruiser USS Houston and the British cruiser HMS Exeter, two Dutch destroyers, four US destroyers and Her Majesty's ships Jupiter, Electra and Encounter and proceeded along the north coast of Madura Island. During the night of the 27th to 28th of February, the 14-ship Abtug force engaged a Japanese naval force in the disastrous Battle of the Java Sea. Five Allied ships were lost during the action, and Perth and Houston were lucky to survive. Low on ammunition, Waller made the decision to withdraw in the night of the 27th, accompanied by her sole surviving consort, USS Houston, under the command of Captain Albert H. Rooks. Waller's action contravened the orders of his Dutch superior, Admiral Conrad Helfrich, to continue action whatever the cost till the better end. But Waller, of all people, knew the difference between gallantry and suicide, and both the combat experience and the moral courage to make the distinction. There can be no doubt that his action was correct. HMAS Perth and USS Houston arrived in Tangjung Pyok on the 28th of February, the day after the night action of Surabaya. Fuel stocks in the port were almost exhausted, and Perth could only receive 50% of full stowage. Preparations had been made to destroy all warehouses and harbour installations, so the opportunity was taken to embark any and all stores that might be useful. Orders were subsequently received to sail in company with Houston and the Dutch destroyer Everston through the Sunder Strait to Childat Jap. Perth and Houston cast off at 1900 hours, making a signal at the same time to Everston to precede them out of the harbour. However, not having received clearance to sail, she was told to obtain the necessary orders and follow as soon as possible. The harbour entrance was soon passed and course set for the Sunder Strait. Houston was stationed five cables astern of Perth. Shortly after sailing, Perth received air intelligence of an enemy force stated to consist of ten transports escorted by two cruisers and three destroyers, sighted at 1600 on the 28th of February, 50 nautical miles northeast of Batavia, proceeding on an easterly course. According to Lieutenant John Harper, Royal Navy, Perth's navigation officer, Captain Waller considered that the Japanese would make the landings east of Batavia during the night of the 28th of February, and that the invasion convoy would, escort would not likely interfere with the passage of Perth and Houston through the Sunder Strait. The two cruisers followed a course as close as possible to the Java coast with Perth leading. Babby Island was sighted on the starboard beam 1.5 miles distant at 22.45. At that time, the Japanese Western Invasion Convoy under General Imura had already entered Bantam Bay, escorted by two cruisers and seven destroyers. This force was supported to the seaward side by the 2nd Division of the Japanese 7th Cruiser Squadron under Admiral Kurita, consisting of two heavy cruisers screened by a single destroyer. Distant cover was provided by the 1st Division of the 7th Squadron, consisting of two cruisers, several destroyers, and the aircraft carrier Rujo. From available records, it appeared that the Perth was first sighted by the Japanese destroyer Fubuki, which was on the patrol northeast of Bantam Bay, some time before the Japanese were sighted by the Allied cruisers. At 23.06, a lookout on Perth sighted a vessel about five miles off St. Nicholas Point. When challenged, she proved to be a Japanese destroyer, believed to be the Harakuze, and was immediately engaged by both ships. Shortly afterwards, other destroyers were sighted to the north and the armament split so as to engage more than one target. Perth received her first hit at 23.26, her second at 23.32, and her third at 23.50. Shortly afterwards, Lieutenant Peter Hancock reported that ammunition was reduced to a few 6-inch practice shells and some star shells. It was at that juncture Captain Waller decided to attempt to force a passage through the Sunder Strait. He ordered full speed and altered course to Topper's Island. Perth had barely steadied on a course when she was struck on the starboard side by a torpedo just after midnight, and a few minutes later, Perth received a second torpedo hit on the starboard side. Captain Waller gave the order to abandon ship. Perth sank approximately 25 minutes after midnight, having received two further torpedo hits, one to her starboard, one to her port side. During the action, a large number of enemy destroyers attacked from all directions, and due to the large number of enemy ships attacking, it was impossible to engage all the targets at once, and some were eventually able to close to a very short range. The Japanese warships were protecting an invasion convoy of approximately 50 ships, and which affected the landing in Bantam Bay in Java. 
According to Japanese reports, 85 torpedoes were expended by Japanese ships during the action, and some of these ended up actually hitting Japanese vessels. USS Houston was still fighting, though badly on fire. She was hit by torpedoes and sank shortly afterwards, rather closely inshore. Fire from Perth and Houston destroyed the Japanese transport Sakura Maru, and three other transports including the headquarters ship Royal Maru. Most of Perth's crew abandoned ship between the second and third torpedoes, though it is doubtful if any of the boats were successfully launched. Many Kali floats and wooden life rafts were launched. During the abandoned ship operation, Perth was under constant fire from several destroyers at close range, and many hits were recorded and casualties caused. Many were killed or wounded in the water by the explosion of the last two torpedoes and the shells exploding in the water. One of Perth's survivors later wrote of the last sighting of Waller. Captain Waller was last seen with his May West life vest blown up at the front of the bridge, looking down at the silent guns. Shortly afterwards, the bridge was seen to receive a shell and Perth's captain was, must have been killed instantly. At the time of her loss, Perth's ship's company totaled 681, comprising 671 naval personnel, 6 Royal Australian Air Force personnel for operating and servicing the ship's aircraft, and 4 civilian canteen staff. Her ship's company numbers were also increased to include a number of men that had been destined to join HMAS Hobart on the 24th of February, but were unable to be transferred as the ship was under attack by aircraft. 374 naval personnel, including Captain Waller, 3 Royal Australian Air Force personnel and 3 canteen staff didn't survive the sinking. 328 men survived the overall, 4 naval personnel were known to have been died offshore on Java, that had been taken prisoner, a further 106 men died in captivity. Four sailors were recovered from captivity in September of 1944 when they were amongst prisoners of war rescued by a US submarine after the sinking of a Japanese cargo ship. After the end of hostilities, an additional 214 men were recovered from Japanese prisoner of war camps and repatriated to Australia. On the 1st of March 1942, Waller was officially declared missing in action, and on the 1st of April 1942, Captain Hector MacDonald Laws Waller was officially declared killed in action. He would have been 41 years old. Survived by his wife and their two sons, he was posthumously mentioned in dispatches in 1946. Admiral Cunningham wrote that Waller's death was a heavy deprivation for the young Navy of Australia, and Rear Admiral James Goldrick subsequently called him the outstanding officer of his generation. His youngest son John followed him into the Navy, entering the Royal Australian Naval College in 1947. Graduating as Chief Cadet Captain, John Waller became a weapons electrical engineer and attained the rank of commander in 1967, before transferring to the Emergency Reserve as a senior Navy research scientist. Waller's name appears on Panel 6 on the Roll of Honor in the commemorative area of the Australian War Memorial Canberra and then the Plymouth Naval Memorial in Devon, England. He is also commemorated by Waller Crescent and Waller Place in the Canberra suburb of Campbell. The Benalla Costume and Pioneer Museum holds his medals and dress uniform. The Waller Division of the Royal Australian Navy Recruit School at HMAS Cerberus, Victoria was named in his honour until the name transferred to a division at the Royal Australian Naval College in 2013. HMAS Waller III of the Royal Australian Navy's Collins-class submarines entered service on the 10th of July 1999. The attendees included John Waller and surviving crewmen of HMAS Perth. On the 13th of March 2010, a memorial to Waller was unveiled in his hometown of Benalla. In April 2011, he was one of 13 service personnel, 11 sailors and 2 soldiers, named by the Australian government for consideration as possible recipients of the Victoria Cross for Extreme Valor in Combat under the review by the Defence Honours and Awards Appeals Tribunal. Concluding its investigations in February 2013, the tribunal recommended that no further award be made to 12 of the 13 servicemen, but that the name Waller, among others, should continue to be used for Royal Australian naval ships after the current bearer was decommissioned. Ordinary seaman Edward Teddy Sheehan would be the sole person selected to be invested with the Victoria Cross from that review. Thanks for listening to the I Was Only Doing My Job podcast, a Doc Network production. This episode was written, produced, and audio engineered by me, Ross Manuel, with additional research done by Laurie Favell. I'd really appreciate it, and it would help out the show, if you took some time to share this with a friend, or leave a review on Spotify, or Google Podcasts, or iTunes, or anywhere that you listen to podcasts, as it really helps other people find the show. If you want to know more about today's episode, with photos, show notes, and transcripts, head to www.thedocnetwork.net 
and follow the show on IWODMJ on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't worry, there's a link in the show notes. If you want to follow me for history-related hijinks and other nerdery, you can follow me on a practically everything at Doc Winters. Once again, thanks for listening and catch you next time. Bye.